Uh, this is a story about some of my experiences in uh, Haida Gwaii, which is used to be called the Queen Charlotte Islands. Um, I went up there, I don't know how many times, maybe three times. Once when I was married, that was the first time. And then the other couple of times I went up when I wasn't married anymore, I was split up. But that place is uh, sort of magic and sort of weird and sort of scary. Um, I used to uh, go up there and I, I would play at the uh, singing surf in Masset uh, for sometimes a month or sometimes two weeks. And then I'd go down south to the Queen Charlotte Hotel and play there for Bernie. Um, Herb Riddell owned the uh, singing surf, and uh, Terry Jacks used to go up there in, in his... He had a fancy boat that you could live on. He used to go up there and party around with Herb. I think they were doing a lot of coke in those days, a lot of these people. Um, but uh, anyway, when I first went up there, I got off the plane and... I uh, can't remember what I was playing for a piano then. It wasn't my CP80 the first time. Uh, probably my Wurlitz are still. And I went up to the hotel and booked in and, you know, met everybody. I would go in that hotel. I had a room in this. It was sort of like a, a flat hotel, you know, with a couple of, a wing of rooms and stuff like that with this bar. And uh, the bar had a sunken dance floor and a stage, and I used to uh, play in there, and uh, well, the room was okay. And uh, I, I met, uh, I started to meet people. There was a guy named uh, Sid. He was a big, huge guy. He was a bouncer there. And uh, Sam, I think Sam was his relative. He was kind of a big guy, too. Uh, they became sort of friends of mine. I remember they took me out the first day to this when I got up there to this place called uh, 90 Mile Beach, it's this huge, long beach that stretches as far as you can see, all sand. And uh, they told me stories about people finding gold coins up there, you know, and uh, Sam took me to another beach called Agate Beach. You could actually drive your car away up that uh, 90 Mile Beach. People used to do that. I never got to do that. But he took me to this other beach called Agate Beach, which was... Unbelievable, there's all these beautiful stones, and I love stones, and so I used to uh, pick up stones. I, I still have some of them. I think I lost some of them somewhere. And I actually, uh, I went fishing there once up in Masset. Uh, he took uh, this old guy, I forget his name, i become friends with. He was one of the elders. They're all families up there. He took me over to the uh, village once and... Uh, showed me all the old totem poles and everything. And then uh, he told me the salmon used to run so thick there, his elders told him that you could almost walk across the bay. Um, and uh, I actually went fishing in Mass at once with a guy and caught a mud shark. That's all I caught. It was about three feet high or something like that when I held it up. And I got a picture of me somewhere with that thing. But Mass at is... Uh, the people look very different in Masset than Queen Charlotte City. Uh, uh, Charlotte City and Skidicket, they are, the girls are beautiful there. I mean, Skidicket, uh, their features are different. Masset, they're more, uh, well, I don't know how to say it, uglier or earthier or something. But anyway, um, and they're very scary up in Masset. If, if you, I'll tell you this little story later about a party I went to up there. Uh, that was on my af long after I was not married anymore. But anyway, uh, it uh, it was good. Be but I remember them in Masset uh, bringing in uh, uh, these big, huge halibut up there. Man, it, the things were probably I don't know. It looked to me like they were at least two or three feet wide, and and you know maybe three feet or more, more high, they were frozen when they came off the boats. The steaks were huge because when you get a steak down here now, halibut, it's so expensive and they're so little. They must be catching ti real tiny ones because uh, when I was up in Masset there, uh, 
You'd, I'd go in the restaurant to have fish and chips. The pieces of fish were huge and beautiful. It's beautiful uh, uh, halibut fish up there. They told me that, no, you know, like the McDonald's used to come up and buy all the crap fish off them, like to make minced fish stuff, you know, their fish cakes and all that, uh, fish fillet. They buy all the shit fish, they called it. Anyway, uh, one time I was sitting in that Masset ho- or the Singing Surf Hotel in Masset. I felt an earthquake up there. It felt like the whole building, it, it went like crack. Like I thought a truck or something had hit the building. But... Uh, I wrote a lot of I wrote a lot of songs up there, uh, and uh, I wrote "Running from the Law" up there, one of my best songs, and another one called "Native of This Land," and uh, it was uh, I still like that "Native of This Land." It's kind of a like a dirge, <laughs> but "Running from the Law" is one of my best songs, and I I recorded it. I don't know if I recorded it up there. I had a little pig nose amp and a little recorder, and I just mic'd the pig nose amp and sang it live. And it's actually still the uh, the best uh, version. And uh, up there, the, the, and I played at the Queen Charlotte Hotel um, after Mass. This is maybe the first times I don't can't remember. Um, but the, the Shard Hotel was always packed too. They were the bars did really good up there, and uh, I remember when I played the Shard Hotel the first time, there was this guy sitting at the bar, and the people to me, you know, when you're a stranger in town and a white guy, it's pretty kind of weird, you know, you know, people all looking at you and wondering who you are, and I, I went through a lot of weird experiences in my life, you know, it's kind of lonely being. Uh, and I had a room way up in this hotel. Uh, there was, they were gutting the hotel. There was only one room, and you had to go up these stairs at the back and walk sort of through this dark area where there's like planks, and the walls are all been taken out. And there's one lonely little room up the top where I used to stay there. But I met uh, this guy that was sitting in the bar. They said, "Don't talk to that guy over there. He's like one of the mean guys around here or something." So I went right over and started to talk to him and became friends with him. His name was Ding Hutchinson. And he lived out in Skidicut, which is the native village outside of Queen Charlotte City. And uh, I later on played a wedding out there for somebody. It was a big native wedding with all this food. That The seafood up there is unbelievable. I also went to a dinner at someone's house one time where they had mussels and octopus and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I can't say I liked that too much, but the wedding was kind of neat. I played Loving You by Elvis and something else, I can't remember. But I used to go to Ding's house after we got to know each other, just trips later, and we I got a picture of us sitting on his porch balcony and uh, jamming out there. He liked Hank Williams. He played the guitar. So he wasn't really scary af- after all, but he was a guy that had some clout up there because I was at a party once where these young bucks were kind of getting on my case and uh, uh, people smashing beer bottles over each other's heads up there and stuff. And I kind of was getting scared and Ding stepped in and told them a thing or two and then they backed right off, you see. And another guy, Ding carved my wife's wedding ring, Lisa's wedding ring, and uh, he made a gold ring for her. She still got it, I guess. And he also carved a beautiful uh, gold bracelet, which uh, I gave to Lisa, which got lost eventually, unfortunately. I found, after me and Lisa broke up, I found Chelsea wearing it once, and I got so mad. I thought, well, how could she do that? And I, so I took that bracelet back. And then later on, when I was partying at uh, Beach Towers one time, this Donna, the black girl I told you about before, I never used to sleep with her or nothing, but she used to use me for partying. Uh, and she gave it to a guy for collateral, and I never got it back. Pretty sad about that. It was a beautiful bracelet. I should have left it. Oh, well, that's another story. Things happen. Anyway, um, yeah, that was that was one of my trips up there. I also went to... Uh, um, I went to uh, Port Clements and uh, 
I seen a, um, the big golden spruce that used to be up there. It was like revered by the uh, natives up there as a magic tree. It was a huge, big tree, sort of golden colored. It was way out in the forest. And this guy, uh, I think it's Sam or somebody, took me out there. We had a hike out there to see it. And years later, some idiot went and cut that thing down. And uh, he got in real big trouble for that. I'm telling you, the natives, they'd kill him if they found him. Um, why he did that, I don't know. But they did save some of the seeds that are at UBC, apparently. Um, so that's one good thing. But I, I did see the tree. I had a picture of it somewhere, too, years ago. I don't know if it's still... I still have it. I remember one time when I was in uh, Charlotte City, everybody was partying. Oh, another guy I met was Randy Price. He was a guitar player. He still plays guitar. He lives in Courtney. And uh, I think Sam lives up in uh, Campbell River or somewhere nowadays. But uh, um, when I was... Randy Price, I got in touch with him a few years ago. Um, but he still plays guitar. But he was sort of... in messing around with guitars but I was like kind of way ahead of those guys when I went up there and and uh they used to hang around me but Randy's a really absolutely beautiful carver too he they told me that argillite is a certain kind of rock that comes from the Queen Charlotte's black that they carve things out of you can only get it there and uh some some guy went and tried to dynamite part of it and cracked a whole part of that mountain because that stuff's really valuable. And I remember one time when I was in Charlotte City, there there was like 400 fish boats or something parked down below the hotel when they had a, uh, they were laid off from fishing. Or maybe it wasn't 400, but it was a lot. And you could go down the dock and go from fish boat to fish boat, and they were partying and partying and partying. And they'd come up to the bar where I was playing and uh, buy all kinds of beer and take it back down to the boats and party down there. And uh, when I was up there, the uh, these people invited me to one day to come over to Sandspit, which is across where the airport is from Charlotte City, across the strait from the North and South Islands. And uh, there's some hot springs on the South Island. I never got to them, though, but I heard there was an earthquake and, and something happened, and now they don't have those hot springs. They had those for thousands of years um but anyway over to Sandspit another story once when I was leaving there I used to have these big huge piano cases for my when I used to take the CP80 up when I finally got it it's heavy itself it weighs crimps I don't know how many pounds but I got these big plywood cases made of three quarter inch plywood lined with foam one for the big harp and one for the keyboard part I'm telling you those things must have weighed six, seven hundred pounds. Uh, I used to fly them up on this little plane up there. It took four guys to lift the big one to carry the thing, and it was heavy then. I used to, they'd pick me up in a truck. I remember once I went to the airport there, and when I was drunk, they dropped me off, and the lady said to me, you got any, uh, got anything you're in that suitcase there? I said, oh, don't worry, I got no guns or bombs. And that's a not a good thing to say. <laughs> She said, do you want to stay here? You're not getting in that plane? I went, oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was half loaded, you know. Every time I left there, just like I have nightmares about the cruise ships, trying to pack all your stuff up off the cruise ship to get off in the morning was such a bummer. You know, you got all this junk to carry. You got to get it off the ship, out to the airport. And same there, you know, take all this stuff over to the airport, but... I got invited to a party one night when I was at the hotel, and they said, why don't you uh, come over the next morning? Tomorrow morning, we're having this big party because the blueback salmon are running. There are certain salmon that's only native to that uh, part, the one river over in near Sandspit. So I said, oh, yeah, okay. So I get up in the morning. We party half the night away. A lot of partying up there, I'm telling you. So I get up in the morning, take a cab out to the, to the dock and then I get a water taxi takes me all the way over to Sandspit and then I I guess I get another cab to get to this trailer I go in there they're all passed out all over the place there's no party at all what a waste of time and money 
And I still had to work at night. And uh, so anyway, when I was up there, they used to give me m magic mushrooms. I had, uh, oh, this one guy gave me a bag of powdered mu magic mushrooms and I used to take them at the hotel. I'd take a pinch about, you know, before my last set and it would start to get high when I'm playing and then afterward, it, I was broken up with Lisa by then. I would, you know, go in my room and listen to George Jones tapes and cry in the blues and and uh, missing my kids. And I, uh, uh, I remember, uh, oh, I also, uh, I'll get back to that, but I took a, I went scuba diving up there once too down at uh, somewhere where I was out of, either Charlotte City or Port Clements or somewhere. Guy took me scuba diving. And he had a whole extra outfit and everything, and we went down, because I'd already learned how to scuba dive in the Caribbean. So, um, yeah, we went scuba diving, and uh, or either that, that was before the Caribbean, I guess. So I'd, I knew I was a good swimmer anyway, and I'd always snorkeled and everything. So we put the outfit on. The water's freezing cold. He told me to pee in my outfit, keep me warm and then we went and dove down I don't know 20 30 40 feet and swam around look at all the crabs it's not like the Caribbean though and then I heard of uh oh Joe Joe Conray that used to be in a band with me called Hat Trick uh that was another band we had for a little while with me and Joe Conroy from Black Snake Blues Band and Peter Sweetser from uh, Foster Child me playing drums we Used to go up to Squamish and play. I remember once we went up to Whistler and went up the mountain and skied all day and came down and sat in the hot tub and went back to Squamish. Man, we were so tired. I couldn't play anyway. But up in Masset, we used to. I used to take these mushrooms. Um, I always used to used to bring back seafood for Mister P at the Sands Hotel. That was his name, Mister Presley. Um, I used to bring back uh, all kinds of. Uh, crab and abalone. I didn't like abalone, but it, I'd bring crab and abalone and some crab for me. Wondered why my fingers were sore sitting in the backyard at Dogwood in the early days there from cracking that crab. But anyway, in the later years when I went up there, after I'd been split up and everything, uh, taking the mushrooms, wandering around in my room, listening to George Jones, there, there was... Uh, there was a girl that used to work at the front desk. She was the daughter of an RCMP officer. And I won't say how old she was because she wasn't that old, but uh, compared to me at the time anyway. I was in my, probably, I don't know what I was, early 40s, late 30s, I don't, can't remember. Um, it was after I'd split up with Lisa because I went up there a couple of times after when I was by myself and... Uh, she used to come and sneak in my room after work and I'd be finished playing. We'd dance around, no clothes on and, and we never really made love, I don't think, but we did a lot of playing around and everything. And then I had uh, one time in the later trips I had, Sid's wife came over and her sister and partied with me in the room. She was, I think she was, uh, she just had a baby and she was still, you know what, breastfeeding or something. I kind of, <laughs> Jesus. But anyway, uh, I should put that in a different one, but that's the way it goes. So um, Anyway, there's a party I got to tell you about. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me, or one of the worst stories I ever heard about was uh, in the later times I went up to Masset. I went to this party one night and... Uh, it was uh, it was over at Sid's place, the big bouncer guy, and of course, his wife was there. She was always after me. She was the one that was over with the sister at the hotel room. Um, anyway, I never really slept with her ever or nothing, but she was always after me. Anyway, we all partied and drinking, and there was talking about people busting bottles over each other's heads, and and then we were talking about guns and. They said, well, Sid said, well, I'll take you out shooting tomorrow at the beach in the morning. Uh, we 
got the 357 Magnum, sawed off shotgun, and all this stuff. And uh, uh, we got partying so much, everybody lost track of everything. And and um, I woke up in the morning, sitting beside his his wife. Everybody's passed out. My pants are down to you know down to my knees, and hers are sort of down to her knees too. And I I don't know what happened, but good lord, I thought, oh my god, what's happened here? This is probably too much information for everybody, but this is a kind of a weird story. Uh, it's this, it's the creepiest thing I ever heard. Uh, anyway, I everybody was passed out, thank God, because, uh, I don't know, everybody fooled around and everybody up there. I wasn't married anymore anyway, but I didn't want to get killed by, by Sid. I hope he never hears this thing. And then when I... Uh, so I straightened myself up and, you know, got her to straighten up. I don't know what we'd done. But we didn't do anything much, probably played around or something. Who knows? And then, so we get, Sid gets up, gets his guns, and he said, oh, I'm going to pick up this guy I know. Uh, so we stop and pick this guy up. He's a white guy with a big beard and dirty looking and like a hillbilly. Uh, it's kind of like we'd see out of deliverance, eh? And he jumps in the truck, he's got sawed-off shotgun and some guns, and we go out to this beach, and I thought, holy shit, I hope that Sid didn't know about me with my pants half down. Uh, he probably probably used me for target practice. Hey, Whitey, get running now. Uh, anyway, we got to this beach, and on the way out, this hillbilly guy with the big beard, he's talking away and you know I don't know if we were smoking pot I don't know it's crazy days he tells me this story it's the ugliest thing I you probably get sick just like me he told me he went out one time and he shot this moose it was a female moose and it was looking at him it was still half alive he went up and fucked it when it was dying now I don't know what you want to think about that but it's pretty sickening eh and anyway we went out to the beach and uh, shot the guns off the three. Anyway, I didn't get shot or killed, so that's uh, that's that story. Boy, who still makes me shudder. Anyway, here's another little story. I I used to play at the uh, Army Navy Club for many years in North Vancouver, um, and uh, I did. Uh, I played there in the Eagles Club, and I met a lot of people over there. I met this one girl, she was from the North Van, uh, what are they called, the uh, uh, the Squamish tribe, I guess they are. Anyway, she, uh, from the Native Indians, she wanted me to, she talking about designing an Indian center for the arts uh, for them. I can't remember her name. She had a little son named Eli, and he had uh, leukemia. And uh, anyway, I wrote a I wrote a poem for him when he died, and it's on a grave up in Squamish at the little Indian graveyard out of Squamish, with my poem on it uh, that I wrote for him about. Oh, it's, I think they got a picture of a horse with wings or something. It was like, you know, your spirit's free and flying away and all that. And I got a I got the poem written down. And with a thank you note from the from the Squamish Indian band for writing them that poem, and uh, we designed this thing. West, my friend, and his friend Leslie, the girl, she was sort of a business person. And Chris Blades, the he was a he was an artist. So I got this team together to design this building for. Uh, for this girl over there whose son was Eli. Now, I, I wish I could remember her name. She used to live with uh, one of the guys from Powder Blues, the horn player, one of the horn players. And uh, they lived down on the reserve down there. There used to be a hotel down on that reserve where I saw Lou Rawls at one time, um, the jazz guy. Anyway, uh, so we get this proposal. I get, I get uh, Chris Blades to draw up the whole proposal and I still got the mat or the plans that he drew. I told him what we wanted in it, and 
he drew up this big thing with totem poles out the front and it was going to have a recording studio in it and a, a thing for kids to learn how to do, you know, like TV and recording and a, maybe a workshop for building things and stuff like that. So we, Chris Blade drew up a beautiful big design. It was a wonderful looking thing. And uh, and then we went over to the, to the uh, council meeting with the Squamish Indian Band and... Uh, um, presented it to him. Chief Dan George, who I used to know from the movies, uh, I used to see him drinking down in the bars watching the strippers <laughs> downtown. Uh, there used to be a strip bar in Granville. I can't remember the name of the place. Uh, but anyway, his son had taken over Leonard George. Uh, he's died since too, but he's, he was chief too for a while. And so we presented this uh, proposal to him with this big thing. It was going to cost about, I forget, $15 million or something like that. But they get government funding. But what happened is they turned us down. Um, West was drinking a lot in those days, so we didn't take him to the meeting because we thought uh, we didn't want him to, th you know. But he was always pissed off about that anyway. Cause, but um, we presented this thing, and then they said no. And then a few years later, they actually built the actual just about exact building down on the thing without our help and without our input. They sort of stole our design. Um, so anyway, that was, that was that trip. Another trip I made was up to Watson Lake. This is another weird trip. Um, I went to the airport. Siegel Entertainment booked me to Watson Lake. I was supposed to go for two months up to this hotel, Watson Lake Hotel. There's a, a video I did of it up there. It's in my on YouTube. And uh, so I get to the ticket with, or down to the airport with all my junk. I got my, you know, the same old thing, seven big cases full of crap, all these chords and songbooks, you know. You didn't have computers much in those days. And uh, my guitar and all the amps and oh, I crips, all kinds of stuff. I get to the airport in a cab. I got to cart it all by myself through the airport. And uh, I get to the thing and my, I go, where's my ticket? They said, oh, we don't have a ticket for you. What? Oh, it's in the wrong name. So then I have to phone Siegel and they got to do all this run around. So I think I missed my plane or something. I can't remember. Finally, uh, I thought, well, this is starting off wonderful. So finally they got my uh, ticket ready. And uh, so I flew up to Wilson Lake. It's like a little hole in the wall. One thing neat, they got a, a place there with all these signs pointing how many miles it is to this place and that place, this place, that place. So I get up there and uh, go to the hotel, take my stuff in, get it all set up and go up and get my room and everything. It's like 35 below up there. And uh, they do have a hot springs up there, too, that people go to, but I never went to it. Uh, I made a video up there with this father and son from, they were from California staying there. And there was another guy there that used to be in the legislature up there. He had a, a lodge somewhere outside of Watson Lake that you could only fly into. And he used to come in in the winter. He used to run the lodge all summer. I forget what he was, Speaker of the House up there or something in the in the Yukon uh, at one time anyway. But he had this lodge that was really isolated. But he'd come in and he'd start to drink in there and he would drink like day and night for, tell he, for weeks or something. I remember him, he was always drinking. Tell he'd get himself sick, I guess, eventually. And uh, there was, yeah, it was like real weird people up there, little, you know, bunches that hated the other bunch and liked the other bunch. And we used to, I used to play the lounge and then I'd go next door and uh, there was a cabaret there. There was a band we used to go over there. And then, then I ran a jam at the lounge for a while and that kind of gets out of hand, be get all these weird people want to get up and sing. And then I forget, I got into some... There was, uh, I went to a party once in a guy's sleeper out the back. Uh, well, I, it wasn't a party, just him and me went out for a drink. He showed me the sleeper in his big truck. 
one of those transport trucks. It was kind of a fancy one in the back. It had a bed and a, well, a bed, that sort of like a bench thing that you sit on, I guess, when he wants he could sleep. And it uh, they leave the trucks running up there 24 hours a day. It's so cold. And then uh, uh, there was these weird girls that hang around the uh, uh, hotel, and they I ended up getting in a disagreement with two of them at the end when I finally got sick of that place. But there was another weird girl that used to come around there. I was kind of attracted to her. She was she was kind of neat looking, and uh, but she was kind of strange too. And I sort of stuck up for her a couple of times. The other girls hated her, you see. And then she actually came up and knocked on my door one day, but I didn't answer it. And uh, the other girls that didn't like her, I ended up getting in a hassle with them, and they reported me to the boss that owned both hotels. And so eventually, um, I finally quit that gig, walked out. For, they held me over for two extra months. I was up there for four months, but man... Talk about drinking up there, boy. They drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. And I partied along with them sometime, most of the time. But, I, you know, I had to still work, so it ended up... It got so all I did is sleep all day, you know, hung over and get up, go down, start drinking again and play all night till I got, you know, so sick of that place. I remember going to a party one time and... There was a lady up there. She made me a big banner. I still got it. It says Richard Step on it with all these stars and everything. Um, I remember we all passed out somewhere one night. I think she'd peed her pants because it was all wet all over the place. That happened a couple of times with her. I guess she had a problem with that or something. And anyway, I finally got so pissed off at that place, I flew. I packed all my stuff up, told the guy to screw off. And I took myself out to the airport and flew my way back home. And uh, another gig I went and played is up in Sparwood, another place, minus 35. It was a piano bar. I had my station wagon, and on my way up, this damn uh, sanding truck with rocks, you know, gravel or whatever, just went by and sprayed all the side of my car, the damn asshole. And uh, I got up there and parked my car, I went down. It was always weird going to these new places, you know, because I'm a little bit shy, actually. And you go in there, you don't know anybody, right? So you sit at the piano and start singing, and all these people are checking you out, looking at you, you know. You try to win them over, right? It's like, uh, it's not a real fun thing to do, I'm telling you. I did it many years at many places. You know, once you get a few friends, it's okay, but break the ice. But it's actually really scary going to a town all by yourself and don't know anybody. And then you always run into tough people and assholes and, you know, nice people. Usually I'd find someone that would sort of protect me or something. But when I parked my car up there, I was actually going out in the morning jogging. It was minus 30 or something or 35. My car froze up and wouldn't start. And I it, I couldn't even get the doors open at first. And finally I... I forget how I did that. I got the door open, got in. It wouldn't start and ran the battery down. And uh, then this guy that was in the bar, he decided he's going to help me. So he comes there and he gets another battery and he hooks it up. We still couldn't get it started. So then he says, well, I got to take this thing up and put ether in it. That'll get it going. So he gets in there and he puts some ether in, boof, like that. You know, flame comes out of the carburetor does that a few times then he put too much in and it goes boo like that singed all his hair and eyebrows and everything <laughs> and he still and we still didn't get it started so anyway finally what we had to do is uh we had to get the car towed to a garage to get it all thawed out so anyway there was something i forgot to tell you uh about this was Ed Cerny, my friend that I went to Nashville with. Maybe I'll put this in separate. Okay, that's my weird stories for you.